Today I'm going to talk about uh, basically setting up the pipeline, the actual infrastructure to support the pipeline. So the landscape of data pipeline technology has changed really drastically um, since the days of like cron jobs and writing pure MapReduce, um, like Hadoop MapReduce jobs. And with the changing landscape, it's actually gotten a lot easier to set up the infrastructure for it. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a little bit of how to set up the infrastructure to support your data pipeline um, from essentially scratch during the session. So we're going to set it up while we, we talk. All right. So um, what is the high level goal of the session? Uh, first, we're going to give you a little bit of an overview of the technology you mentioned for those who are not familiar. Um, and then we're going to set up the entire pipeline during this talk. So first, let's briefly talk about why we want to set this up, why it's important, and also why we chose these technologies in particular. Uh, so the infrastructure your data pipeline lives on um, determines its capabilities and robustness. Um, the technologies that we chose today uh, basically make sure that you have a really robust and flexible data pipeline infrastructure to allow you to easily create and manage like business intelligence, data analytics, machine learning, ETL, and much more. So um, the technologies you're working with, uh, why we chose these? These are basically the best in class tooling available right now. Um, most of them are open source. Uh, on the open source camp, there's Airflow, which uh, uh, Gerard talked a lot in length about. Uh, it's very exciting. It's very cool. It's kind of the trend right now. Um, it's used for scheduling and visualizing complex workflows, but it can also do much more. Uh, we are going to use Spark because it's really fast. Um, it's also extremely popular right now with a really rich set of APIs um, that users love. Uh, we're also going to take advantage of Kubernetes, which is container or or orchestration, uh, to set up the infrastructure today. Um, additional to the open source technologies, we're also going to leverage AWS EMR. And the reason we use it is because it's really easy to use, it's uh, relatively cheap, and it supports a number of different frameworks, uh, including Spark. So big picture at what we're going to build together today. Um, this is essentially the infrastructure. We're going to have a scheduling layer um, as well as a computation component. Uh, for the scheduling layer, we're going to basically deploy air containerized Airflow onto a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we're going to, for this demo, we're going to use a simplistic version of Airflow. We're going to use the local executor instead of salary executors. So the scheduler, the worker, as well as the web server are going to live in the same pod. Um, uh, so Airflow is backed by Postgres. That's going to live in a separate pod. Um, we also modify the, the, the Airflow image a little bit to contain um, some user DAGs that we initialized uh, Airflow with. Um, so for the computation component, we're going to leverage EMR, as we mentioned. Um, and all the batch computation for data store, we're going to use S3. Um, in addition to using S3 as a data store for our computation, we're also using it as a state store for Kubernetes, um, as well as the store to store artifacts that we're going to run, so these spark jars. All right, so, um, so basically, nitty gritty, this is what we're going to do step by step. We're going to spin up Airflow on Kubernetes, and we're going to use uh, tools like COPS or kubectl, um, as well as Helm to do so. Uh, we're then going to talk a little bit about how we're customizing the uh, containerized Airflow to suit um, our needs today. Uh, then we're going to put on our data engineering hats on and talk a little bit about creating an Airflow DAG, um, specifically about uh, setting up um, Airflow to talk uh, and communicate with EMR. Uh, then we're going to briefly talk about how do we deploy DAG changes in this model. Um, and finally, we're going to go into um, uh, the Spark code a little bit and, and, and basically play around in Zeppelin. All right, let's talk about spinning up Airflow on Kubernetes. This is going to start being fun. Um, so a brief word about Airflow, uh, in case if you all don't know, I think most of you already know this, but it is much more than a scheduler. Um, it has, uh, basically, you can define task dependencies uh, and workflows in code in Python. Um, it has a really, really great UI that you can use for, um, basically, as a control panel, but also to access logs and other, other visualizations. Um, for example, uh, in, on this page, you have two of the visualizations available. One is for the DAG view, and one is for the tree view. So 
uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, uh, again, if you don't know this already, it's open source. It's like up and coming. It's, uh, it's more than up and coming. It's already like the de facto uh, thing to use. Um, but we're going to use Kubernetes today because it's really easy to spin up services with Kubernetes. Um, you have less operational toil because uh, you don't need to write puppet manifests or wait for a host to spin up. Um, it also means that things are portable because like, you're not as dependent on host configurations. So high level architecture, uh, Kubernetes uses the master slave model. Um, for the master, which is the control plane, it's backed by etcd, a distributed key value store. Um, and there are Kubernetes nodes where um, basically our containers are going to run on. So you can read more in, in the link. All right. So we're going to use COPS, um, which is a command line tool, to spin up a Kubernetes cluster right now. So let's see. All right, let me see if this works. All right, cool. All right, hopefully everything just works magically. All right. <laughs> um, so my script is running right now. And while we're waiting for it, let me show you what the script actually looks like. All right, cool. Let me know if you can see this clearly. Um, it's actually hard for me to see. <laughs> but basically, we're creating a cluster with two nodes. Um, we actually don't need that much like uh, uh, resources for spinning up a local executor airflow. So we're going to give it very little. Um, and then we're going to actually spin it up by doing the update cluster, dash, dash, yes. We're going to use COPS to validate the cluster. Basically, it will check if the cluster is completely up or not. Um, and then we're going to set up the Kubernetes dashboard and open it up for us. So you can read more about COPS in that link below. All right, so uh, the script that I just showed you had a part where it was uh, spinning up and setting up the dashboard. So that was using a tool called kubectl. Um, it's extremely powerful. You can use it to find out information about pods, which are basically the containers, um, to configure or scale the cluster. Uh, you can also to, uh, use it to apply configs for the Kubernetes dashboard. So that's what we're going to use kubectl for right now. Um, we're basically going to set up a customized Kubernetes dashboard so we can easily demo it for this presentation. Um, so it's being spun up right now, the cluster, but eventually it will look something like this, the dashboard. So this is the nodes page, which contains information about the actual physical instances um, in the cluster. Uh, the dashboard you can actually use to um, not only see information, but you can actually use it to um, deploy applications to your Kubernetes cluster. You can troubleshoot it. You can manage the cluster itself. Um, but obviously, uh, today, we're only going to use it for actually monitoring what's going on. So there's this other page, uh, which is pods. So a little bit more information about pods. A pod is basically a group of containers that are deployed together to the same host. Um, for today's presentation, we're actually deploying single containers. So um, a pod is basically a single container in this case. So uh, another concept is services. Uh, so Kubernetes services are abstraction that defines uh, a logical set of pods and their access policy. Um, the, the reason this is important is because um, a lot of these pods are not meant to live forever. Um, there are these things called replica sets, which means there are multiple pods within a replica set, and they may spin up and down. And with services, that means we can have consistent, uh, basically, throughput, uh, even if the individual pods are spinning up and down. Uh, last but not least, we're going to use the Kubernetes dashboard to actually look at the logs for each pod. All right. so. Let's look at if our pods are spun up or not. So I have my AWS console here. All right, this might be hard. I can't see where my mouse is. <laughs> um, but I can see that there are a bunch of nodes spun up. So that's a good sign. Oops. They're still initializing, which means they're still in the process of being spun up. All right. Cool. 
So while they are being spun up, let's talk a little bit about how we're going to achieve deploying an application to Kubernetes. Um, and we're going to use something called Helm. Um, it's basically the package manager for Kubernetes. Um, you can think of it kind of like homebrew, but for Kubernetes. It helps you manage your Kubernetes application. Um, you can basically use it just like you use Homebrew, you can install, you can upgrade, um, and you can define really complex Kubernetes applications using uh, Helm. So today we're going to set up Helm with Helm in it, and then we're going to actually deploy Airflow. So um, a central concept in Helm is something called charts, which are basically the packages that you want to deploy. Um, Helm itself is uh, consists of like two main parts. One is Helm, which is the command line tool, which I'm using on my local computer right now. Um, the other part of it is a server part, which is called Tiller, which you need to basically install on your Kubernetes cluster itself, and it will manage the releases for you. All right, so let's see the status of what's going on. So I have this loop going on <laughs> that checks the status of the cluster. And it seems like at least uh, things are up, but not fully set up. So let's give it a few more moments. OK, while we wait for it to, this is taking longer than usual, but it's OK. I'm prepared for this. Um, Let's talk a little bit about customizing and deploying Airflow. Um, so we talked a little bit about Helm, right? So we want to deploy an Airflow chart, basically, to our Kubernetes cluster. And there's actually a lot of open source repositories out there that help us do so. And the one I'm using today is called Kube Airflow. Um, it's written by Mamushu. And it basically provides chart as well as a set of tools to deploy Airflow onto any Kubernetes cluster. So let's go in and look at the code. All right. So, um, oops. All right. Uh, you see here, um, wow. it's actually kind of hard to see where I am. <laughs> Tell me when I'm at chart.yaml. This is one. OK, cool. <laughs> so this is where you define the, the description of this chart. And you can see this is a chart for an Airflow installation. Um, what's also really critical here is this uh, values.yaml. And uh, this is where we define um, all of the customizations that we want to use, um, except, for example, which uh, Docker image to point to. Um, OK, uh, and also what kind of executor to use. So this values.yaml file is actually used to populate everything in this template directory. And what's in this template directory is actually all the actual Kubernetes manifests, which Kubernetes will use to uh, spin up the application. So you can see here that um, this is uh, the services that we're going to spin up. Uh, the deployments that we're going to do. So this is basically what we are going to deploy. All right. Let's check up on our cluster. And you can see that, yay, it's finally up. This usually takes around six minutes. So um, take a little bit longer than usual. But six minutes is actually not that long to spin up an entire Airflow cluster. Uh, right now, we only have the Kubernetes cluster itself. Um, but deploying Airflow is actually relatively quick. So let's actually explore a little bit in the UI. All right, cool. So right now, let's click into the, the node page. And you can see, as we saw before, these are the actual physical instances. Then let's go into the pods page. And we can see that there are no pods right now because we haven't deployed anything onto our cluster. It's an empty cluster. So. Let's go ahead and 
do that. Remember we talked about um, Helm and Tiller, right? So in order to have Helm even work, we will need to, oops. Okay, this is, I can't see. Uh, we're gonna install Tiller first. All right, there we go. This basically creates a service account called Tiller and installs it on the Kubernetes cluster and it's done. Cool. Awesome. So uh, the actual thing we're deploying here is uh, it's pointing to a Dockerized image of Airflow, which is the Docker Airflow repository. It's also open source. It's actually one of the most popular uh, containerized Airflow repos out there. It supports like customization of uh, the Airflow uh, image itself, and it allows for different types of task executors to be chosen. So let's go ahead and deploy the Airflow chart, which uses Docker Airflow. This is happening right now. Cool. All right. It just installed Airflow on our Kubernetes cluster. And we can easily verify this by going to the cluster page again and refreshing this page. Yay, look, we have two containers spinning up right now. And let's check up on them in a little bit. Cool. Uh, so let's go into the Docker Airflow repo a little bit as well. Awesome. Uh, so basically, the main thing here to know is the Docker file. Um, it's pretty standard. We're going to install a bunch of packages that we're going to use for Airflow. Um, and then we're going to install Airflow itself. And then eventually, we're going to hit uh, this script, which is the entry point. Uh, we modify the entry point script slightly to customize our version of Airflow image here. Uh, we're using the local executor, for example. Um, this basically customizes a bunch of things like uh, where where your um, Redis port is and what is where your Postgres port is. In our case, we're using local executor, so we actually don't have a Redis instance spun up. Uh, the other thing that we customize is we initialize this image with a number of DAGs, the tutorial DAG and the finance DAG, and we'll talk about both of these um, very shortly. Cool. So if we look at our, our uh, pods right now, we can go ahead and click into the logs page and see that the Airflow instance is completely up. This is where we can actually start doing stuff. Um, first, we're going to tunnel into the Airflow web instance uh, using kubectl again. Then we're going to hit localhost 8080, which is where we port forwarded to. And now we can see that the Airflow UI is, is up. Both the DAGs are default um, uh, not on. Uh, but we can go ahead and turn the finance tag on right here. Click into it. Awesome. So now the DAG will run. Cool. Awesome. So uh, now the DAG is actually running. Let's talk about what the DAG is actually doing here. Uh, so for those who don't know, the Airflow DAG is basically uh, uh, acronym for a directed acyclic graph. Um, it's basically the, the 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 dependency graph of like how your tasks depend on each other and their relationships. 
So it's uh, directed because all tasks um, basically uh, are ordered. So task two have to have to run after task one, et cetera, et cetera. It's acyclic because you don't want infinite loops in your dependency. Um, and in Airflow, tasks are represented by things called operators, uh, which perform an action, for example, like transfer data or seeing if something is uh, running or, or, or um, has been completed. Um, so example is running a bash script or calling a Python function. Um, in our case, we're going to use uh, Bodo um, AWS SDK to call out to EMR. So this is the structure of our uh, DAG. We're going to complete five tasks. We're going to uh, do a listing on the prefix to see if contents are there. Uh, then we're going to spin up an EMR cluster, uh, run the Spark job, uh, we also have a task sensing task that will make sure the Spark job has completed, either fail or success. Um, and we're going to spin down the cluster. So the workflow looks something like this. The first task, we're going to use the Python operator. Subsequently, we're going to use um, basically uh, like operators defined in the contribution section, a package of Airflow, uh, create job flow operator, add step, um, EMR step sensor, and finally term terminate job flow. In this case, job flow means uh, EMR cluster. OK, cool. Now let's actually dig into the uh, definition of these in code. So you can see we very simply, like this is the most simplistic version of a DAG you can, you can define. We're going to give it a name. We're going to tell it uh, what the schedule interval is. You can use this, uh, use the shorthand like this, or you can actually use cron notation. Um, and then we're going to specify the dependency structure below. So the tree view looks something like this, which we saw before. Uh, the, 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 the lowest box represents the most upstream task, and the highest box represents the, uh, the least the the leap, uh, the most downstream task, and the circle above uh, indicates the status of the entire DAG. So once we complete the entire uh, like DAG, all of it will be dark green, including the circle above. Um, so uh, the tasks are running right now. Um, let's go ahead and see what the status of them are. Let's see. All right. Cool, so it's on. Uh, it completed all three of these. We can, and it's running this one. So let's go ahead and click on the logs and see what's up to. All right, so this is the watch previous step. Um, step, And it, what it's doing is poking at the cluster itself and querying the status of the step that was added. Um, it does this every minute or so, and then it'll finish once uh, it gets a complete status. So let's talk a little bit about EMR. Um, AWS EMR is basically like provides managed Hadoop clusters to you. You can uh, run uh, a number of distributed computation frameworks, for example, Spark. Uh, and the reason you want to use it is because it's very easy. You can use the console to spin it up. You can also use AWS CLI as well as various um, AWS SDKs. In this instance, we're using Bodo. Uh, it's very elastic, so you can scale and auto scale um, based on resources. Uh, and then it's also like uh, in terms of configurations, actually highly tuned. AWS has a lot of experience um, managing Hadoop clusters, so all the configurations are are pretty optimized. Um, and last but not least, the price is actually pretty reasonable. It's from uh, between ten and thirty cents, and depends on the instance type. So it's actually not a huge um, cost. All right, and. The specific operators that we're using today in order to achieve this are um, the EMR hooks that are provided to you already in the contributor package. And we, we talked a little bit about these already. Um, so the top four are basically um, the high level abstractions, which use the EMR hook. And underneath all of this is Bodo 3. So uh, we mentioned Bodo 3 specifically because um, Airflow documentation on this is actually pretty sparse. So if you want to configure your cluster um, to do anything uh, that is customizable, you have to look at the documentation there. Um, and we're going to use the Bodo3 documentation to customize our cluster a little bit. So 
let's go through each task definition. Um, first, we're going to create the actual cluster. Um, it's pretty standard here, except we're overriding the job flow configuration with our own. And the especially the portion that I really want to call out is the bootstrap action. So bootstrap action on EMR means some kind of script that you run on each node before the cluster marks itself ready. Um, and in our case, we're actually going to use it to um, copy over the Spark jar that we're going to run to every single node. Um, this means that uh, to deploy a new Spark job, you basically would only need to package the jar and uh, copy it over to S3. The next time a cluster runs, it'll pick up the newest jar. OK, so this is what it looks like on the EMR console. Um, it will show itself as a bootstrapping mode. OK, cool. Um, so the next step is we want to actually add a step, which is uh, the actual Spark job that we want to run. Um, over here, you can see that it's also pretty straightforward. The only thing I want to call out is the job flow ID. It's, templated, uh, it's a templated field. Um, so we're going to actually refer back to the task above it and pull down the cluster ID. So this is what it looks like on the console itself. You can see that step has been added. Uh, usually, we want to block downstream from running until the Spark job has been completed, right? So um, there's actually a hook to do this called EMR Step Sensor. It's really useful. And over here, both the job flow ID as well as the step ID are templated fields. Um, so it's going to refer to the dynamic uh, cluster ID and step ID. In this case, um, if the job fails, um, this task will fail. So, it, uh, uh, so if if your downstream task depend on this succeeding, it will not complete. Um, cool. And then this is basically what we saw before. It will ping the cluster continuously until it hits a good point. All right. Cool. So last but not least, we actually want to spin down the cluster after this is done. Uh, we don't want manual intervention. So uh, this here will actually kill the cluster. Um, one thing to note here is we have a trigger rule of all done. Um, this is because we want to kill the cluster regardless of whether the job succeeded or not, because we don't want to incur the extra cost um, even if the job failed. Cool. Um, after the job is completed, the console will show something like this, where the cluster is terminated. Awesome. Um, and this is what the tree view will look like. Cool. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Airflow UI again to see where we're at. And you can see that it's actually just finished, just literally one second ago. Uh, it finished running the entire DAG. So. Let's also take a look at the EMR console to make sure that it actually did do something. So as you can see here, literally this is just happening. Um, and the step has completed. And it did run the Spark job. So great. OK, so now let's talk a little bit about um, actually deploying DAG changes. So it's actually really easy to do this, um, even on Kubernetes. Uh, Airflow automatically picks up any changes specified in a DAG directory. So all you really need to do is sync up your DAG changes to the directory um, on the Kubernetes cluster on the pod. Um, so basically, what I have set up here is um, for I will grab the uh, the, the names for the pods that I want to uh, basically sync up to. And then I will use kubectl to copy over um, the, 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 the changes in the DAG. And it'll overwrite whatever was there. So I have a handy script to do this, which is basically uh, what I saw there. So if we want to make any changes here, we will basically run this, and it will sync up. Great. So that's. That's all it takes to deploy your DAG changes. 
cool. So before we jump into the next section, let's go ahead and explore uh, the Airflow UI a little bit more of what we set up. So first, let's see. What would be really cool is I want to see like what the time um, spent on the time distribution on the tasks are. So it's really useful. You can look at the Gantt chart. You can see that most of the time was actually waiting for the step um, to complete, which makes sense. You can also see things like the graph view, which is essentially the job workflow that we saw before. Cool. So all of the usual tools are available to us in this Airflow instance. Awesome. OK, now we finally get to the part where we actually do a little bit of programming. Um, we're going to use Zeppelin today. So what's Zeppelin? Zeppelin is a web-based notebook with a built-in Spark interpreter. It also has other different backends like Hive. Um, and uh, you can basically use it to iterate on job, Spark jobs really quickly, or um, you can use it directly to perform your analysis that you want to do um, and create visualization. It's completely open source uh, and also supports plugins. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually use EMR again to spin up a Zeppelin cluster. Um, so I had done this previously because um, it actually takes a little bit on AWS to provi for provision instances. Um, so I had done this previously, and all you need to do is check the, uh, that the Zeppelin application is chosen. So this is up. Uh, this is what it looks like. And we're going to do a little bit of data analysis on the Deutsche Börse. Um, and then we're going to use the built-in chart capabilities a little bit. Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is actually really, really hard for me to read. Um, I probably need to upgrade my glasses pre prescription because I, I just can't read stuff. Uh, so you can see here that we're reading the CSV files um, up from S3. Uh, so this data set is actually a publicly available data set um, on AWS Open Registry. So you can take a look at it as well. Uh, so we're just using pure Spark here. We're going to read it. We're going to let it infer the schema. Um, and running is really easy. So we're going to run this. Um, after we ingest the data from S3, uh, we are going to uh, do some operations on the data frame itself. Um, so you can actually integrate Zeppelin with a Hive Metastore. So you can directly query Hive tables if you wanted to. Um, in this case, we're just going to go for S3. OK, cool. Uh, let's run this to see what the max end price is. All right, I think we have to. Okay, cool. So that's basically what it looks like. So if we group by the underlying symbol and get the maximum price, uh, basically we get an array of tuples. Nice. All right, what's really powerful though is not actually running Spark SQL, but you can actually run uh, Spark Scala, but you can actually run Spark SQL. So now we're going to create um, a temp view called stocks based on the data frame that was loaded here. Wow, this is like I cannot know where I am right now. Okay, let's do this. Okay, cool. 
So we can basically use all of our familiar tooling at this point. Um, we can select from the data frame. Cool. Uh, as you can see, the results returned, and uh, we can inspect its underlying content. Cool. All right. And then we can also do things like, uh, we can select the time. Um, stocks. Now I finished typing, we can run this. All right, there's a problem. And it says, cannot resolve end price. Great. So if we take a look here, I had misspelled end price. Cool, and this is actually running a Spark job in the back end. So Zeppelin does a thing where it actually uh, exponentially increases the number of uh, tasks it, it uses. So start with two, four, and then eight. So that's why like sometimes it's like it goes to 50 and then it goes back. Um, cool. So now we end up with this awesome info. And what I wanted to show is how easy it is to, to chart using Zeppelin. So um, you can see this is data from every minute. Um, of the Deutsche Börse for a random security ID that I chose. And from three o'clock to uh, eight o'clock, um, this is basically the end price movement. So it's pretty easy to do all of this. Cool. Uh, so um, again, uh, we did some, some charting here uh, and you can actually install things called Helium packages onto Zeppelin to augment what you can do. Uh, for example, with Helium packages, you can actually use Google charts or high charts to do like really powerful graphing if you wanted to. Um, in summary, what did we do today? We spun up Airflow using Kubernetes. Yay, we did it. Um, we customized the Airflow image a little bit, uh, as I shown before. Um, we created an Airflow DAG and then we uh, within the DAG, the task actually called out to an EMR cluster and added steps to it. Um, we were able to deploy DAG changes to it uh, if we wanted to. And finally, we were able to, using EMR again, uh, iterate uh, on, on Spark jobs uh, with Zeppelin. So we spun up this whole thing. Yay. Cool. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.